So I am so thrilled, so excited. I almost couldn't sleep last night because today's round table is on tank rehab. How to prep when you don't know what to expect. And I have pulled together an amazing panel, a bunch of my favorite people when it comes to tanks and um, kicking it off. Well, first I'll introduce myself. I'm Christine Gonzalez. I am the storage tank queen. <laughs> and um, 27 years of experience doing tank rehabs, uh, but I'll also be your moderator today. My colleague, Rob Horvat, he's the regional director of NTEX, I'm sorry, NTEX Pittsburgh office. And in, has it been four years, five years, almost five years, uh, he and I have worked together on already on dozens of tank rehabs and new tank construction. My buddy, Ralph, Ralph Wardzinikowski, He's the engineering project manager from Pennsylvania American Water, and he's responsible for maintaining over 350 tanks throughout Pennsylvania. Nick Bressler is the director of operations at WIT, that's World International Testing. They focus on water tank inspections in addition to bridges, cranes, and other structures. And he's got, if you need testing done, any sort of non-destructive testing, he's got the gizmos and gadgets to do it. Amy Stolstis is a field operations manager and estimator with IK Stolstis, a painting and tank rehab contractor. And I've known the Stolstises for 27 years. When I started in the business, like my first week, they're like, hey, call Stolstis, they'll give you a price to paint the tank. <laughs> I've been using them ever since. They're a wonderful contractor. And finally, Joe Papo returns to our panel. He's the technical services manager with DN Tanks. That was formed with a merger of DYK and NatGun, and his forte is concrete tank rehabs. So before we actually get into our Q&A and discussion, I mentioned it's all about you, the audience. It's all about what you need to, or what you want to know, your struggles when it comes to tank rehabs. So I'm gonna launch a poll right now. And this will go out to the audience. So the question is, what are your biggest struggles in doing a tank rehab? So your biggest struggles is multiple choice. So if there's a few of them, please pick them. And what this does, it gives us a focus. I swear to God, we could spend all day. Uh, we could spend eight hours or more just talking about tank rehabs. And in fact, um, Ralph, you and I were chatting uh, when we talked, what, like three or four weeks ago, I said, hey, doing another round table. I want to do tanks. I want you on it. Oh, just, do we delve into coatings? And he's like, hmm, you know what? No, you know what? Let's go back. Let's, let, let, let's take a broader view for people who just don't get to do tank rehabs on a regular basis. It's hard. You don't know what you don't know. I guess, Ralph, for you, like you're doing it every day, right? Sure. Yeah. And, uh, you just put this poll out. I'm disappointed. I can't answer all of the above to this, to this question here. <laughs> So even though you do it all the time, you still have some of these struggles? Every day. Yeah, <laughs> that's uh, that's part of the fun, I guess, right? That's job security. <laughs> well, and honest to God, I mean, when I started do building tanks, doing new tanks, the first few, it is so hard, so hard. And all I could think was, please let me find someone who knows what they're doing. Sure. And then I find someone like Jamie. <laughs> Or then I talk to someone like Rob, who's done it a bunch of times, and oh my God, so, so much easier when and you're doing, doing it with someone who's done it before. So uh, audience, I'll give you another five seconds to respond, and I will end the polling, and let's launch the results here. I'll share the results with everyone. So looks like top one, when is the right time? To rehab the tank in its lifespan and I, I like for me I was like I, I thought that was a good one um, honestly I had like 12 questions <laughs> I could have posed out there because this is just so much that you can talk about when it comes to this sort of thing so it looks like second question so thank you Rob and Ralph you were the ones who said permitting is very very important we should have a, uh, that as an option and then the lead paint okay cool so thank you so much audience for giving us a sense of what your struggles are uh, this lets us know uh, where we should go. So um, let's kick it off. Ralph, you own, <laughs> you care for 350, over 350 tanks. When's the right time to rehab a tank? 
for your firm or your company? Um, what's the what's the basis of it for you guys? Yeah, so we kind of have a a, a pretty rigorous uh, maintenance plan where we follow DEP and AWWA guidance, and we inspect our water tanks every three to seven years. Uh, we try to stay less than five years uh, between inspections, just so we know what's going on inside the tank. And when we inspect the tank, we try to drain it. Uh, get it dry inside and let an inspection firm, uh, we utilize TIC, Tank Industry Consultants, but utilize any inspection firm to come in, take a look at the inside of the tanks and uh, write us a report on what the condition is like. And, um, you know, that report will then detail what all is needed and if it is time to rehab. So the only way you know is by taking a look at your tank. And if for some reason you can't get it out of service, there's divers or there's ROV inspection or there's things like that. But that's the best way to know whether you need a rehab. Uh, conventional speaking says it's every 25 to 30 years, but you, you just don't know. Some conditions are worse than others. Mm -hmm. Good point. So Nick, when you guys go out and inspect tanks, uh, what's your sense of, um, you not only inspect it and write a report, but you offer recommendations. So when it comes to say fully repainting a tank inside and out, what stage is it normally at uh, for you guys to make that sort of recommendation? A couple of things come into play. First of all, we want to know, obviously, the overall condition. And if there's corrosion and section loss, if you can address it at early stages, then you cut down a lot of your overhead in terms of steel repair. So a lot of these tank inspections, you want to get them before a lot of the costly steel repairs kick in. So it could add 20, 30 percent to your project, even more. And in some cases, you may have safety and OSHA violations. So uh, as one of our panels mentioned, doing the routine inspections, there could be a safety hazard. So sometimes we prioritize these deficiencies and then we categorize them in needs and whether it's a, a notable item for an upcoming maintenance or if it's rejectable. In other words, if you don't address it now, it could be very costly for you in the future or in the fracture critical or uh, what we call a, a, a danger to life and property, then we'll address it then. So. There's three categories when we dip, uh, uh, categorize our deficiencies. So if we're doing tanks, you may not need a rehab. You just may need something simple, a simple OSHA upgrade. So prioritizing it after a condition assessment is the first step when we, when we jump into this. But when we get called in to do a pre-design survey, we already know we're gonna be doing inspection. So at that point, we're adding additional data, dimensions and things of that nature. So, so if we're not writing the spec or another firm is writing that they have all the data, not just the conventional inspection report, we actually go one step further to help the engineers along so they don't have to go back up there and climb and recalculate. So if we're doing multiple tanks, then we play all those factors in, or if we're doing five tanks or 10 tanks, like recently we did uh, 11, we categorize them all in need of priority at that point based Excellent. on all those deficiencies. And in some cases you may target one tank, but then you might have a repair just on one, just to fix something that's a hazard to, to someone climbing, for example. Okay, cool. Um, so Joe, give us a sense on the concrete tank side. Um, when, when do you know a tank needs a rehab? And like in my mind, I'm immediately thinking one thing. What, what would you say to that? So yeah, so I, I mean, um, it varies a lot depending on the kind of tank that it is. You know, if it's a cast in place concrete tank versus a pre-stressed concrete tank, and if it is a pre-stressed concrete tank, what vintage it is. I mean, we you know, there are many older pre-stressed concrete tanks that were built in the you know 50s and 60s that have a gunite core wall versus our current type of pre-stressed tank, which has a cast in place core wall. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, of like variations out there. Um, but inspection, you know, that's uh, you know one of the greatest tools that all of us have out there, you know, to be able to monitor things. And, um, you know, what are some of the big things that you see with concrete are, you know, depending on the climate, but you know, like things like free thaw damage, cracking, efflorescence buildup, you know, things like that are sometimes indicators that, you know, that there could be something going on. Efflorescence is often, um, you know, it's that white kind of hard crusty staining on the outside of the concrete. You see it a lot on, you know, a brick wall or something like that. Well, it's the same, same thing with like with with a concrete, right? It's moisture reacting with the free lime inside the concrete. So sometimes, sometimes things like that can be indicators. I see. I was thinking, if you see a leak, then you gotta, <laughs> then you need to you need to do something. But you know that's true of any tank, <laughs> any type of. <laughs> hey Ralph, have you seen any leaks uh, from freezing or any any of you guys see any freezing tanks or leaks or problems this year? 
I don't want to jinx it. I don't want to jinx it. <laughs> yeah, I as I said, Christine, it's, it's been really quiet this year. Thanks for asking. <laughs> well, Nick, I know you were just out one, at one um, with ice problems recently, weren't you? I just returned. Um, successfully, we used a very complicated technical approach to sealing the tank, a wood plug, <laughs> and it worked. Um, it, it was a very dangerous situation because we thought structurally we we're going to run into problems as well. They couldn't find a way to drain it and without putting people out of service. But and this was, the, this was an was, elevated tank with legs and cross bracing and everything, right? Yes. We managed to, we got a 110 foot man lift, maneuvered it in between the cross bracing, knocked off a few uh, icebergs, if you will, plugged it. And uh, that's why I just got back. Uh, the county's happy. We got the 110 man. We needed a backhoe and a grader just to get up there because it had been leaking for almost two weeks. And you imagine they it would have sunk the Titanic if you just saw how big this, this uh, mound of ice was everywhere. But so far, so good. The plug held, and I made it to the meeting. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know, speaking uh, of frozen tanks, I mean, this is the right time of year to talk about it. Whenever uh, I'll routinely get calls from people, you know, when it gets like this, I'm like, Christine, I've got a frozen tank. What do I do? I say, call Jamie. Because <laughs> you handle that sort of thing, right, Jamie? Yeah, we've had uh, we've had a few occasions to uh, get called in on an emergency basis. Um, one tank a few years ago was an elevated tank that I think the operators thought it was frozen and stopped pumping water into it. And that, that kind of only made problems worse, but we ended up uh, getting the riser thawed out. Uh, we found that there was just a, a very small area of water flow through it by putting a camera down inside. And, and uh, I think we had generators running there for about two weeks with uh, heat on the riser and insulation wrapping the riser. But uh, yeah, there's definitely uh, definitely some interesting things. And then I guess the other project we did, uh, I guess with Rob also about a year and a half ago, we opened up the tank and there's like, um, you know, probably a hundred tons of ice in there. And we couldn't do it. We couldn't begin our rehab project because of how much ice was in the tank. And it was totally a surprise to everybody. <laughs> I remember you sending me a picture of that. I was at Pennsylvania Rural, I'm like, Oh, this just doesn't look good at all. <laughs> but the cool thing was for that particular project, you had containment up. So you were actually able to work on the outside, the blast and prime the outside of the tank. Inside the containment was nice and warm. And if anything, it may have even warmed up the tank to help it melt the ice inside. So <clears throat> really every situation is different. And so you just don't know what's going to happen. Yes, Nick. So when you have an elevated tank, uh, they rehabbed it and they drilled, you know, you drill additional weep holes in your balcony to reduce the ponding water. They drilled through the leg, a doubler plate. So, and nobody knew that, of course. So that winter, two or three of the legs froze with water and sheared and the, the one million gallon elevated tank almost collapsed. Oh my God. So if the painters just didn't pay attention, they just drilled holes in the floor they went through the top tube of the leg, the tubular leg. Just, wow. uh, that, was, that was one of my favorites. And the other favorite one was they put a mixing system in Pennsylvania on a tank and they tapped the conduit through the sidewall. They lost power, the water froze and it ripped the conduit off of the hole. The water traveled down the conduit into the building, the pump house building, and they couldn't figure out why they couldn't get any water. And they opened up the door, the whole entire building telemetry, cellular, everything was just one block of ice in the building. Oh and it God. all came down a, a sheared conduit. <laughs> oh, you know what, like, um, that's why I love you guys. Such cool stories, thank you. <laughs> so Rob, back to that initial question that we were considering, when it comes to a tank rehab, how do you know it's the right time? So uh, from an engineering standpoint, how do you uh, approach this question? You know what? A lot of times we rely upon folks like Nick and you know a third-party inspection and getting an expert out there to to do a full assessment on the on the uh, on the tank. Um, you know, anybody can look at a tank from the outside and say, "Well, it looks terrible," um, but but knowing whether or not it's time, you know, sometimes sometimes a tank that that looks terrible is actually has actually weathered the way it's supposed to. Um, 
and and it's not necessarily a huge at that point if it looks terrible it probably needs to be have some type of uh attention paid to it but you know a lot of times you know some of the worst tanks that i've seen looking at them um you know after experience you see one who that that, that deteriorates consistently on, on, around the outside it's actually a good thing it's done what it needed to do uh and it lasted well throughout its lifespan um but yeah you get somebody one of these third party folks involved in in a pre-assessment um it's it's super valuable to to the design engineer you get your 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 measurements done um, you get a, a full assessment of what's going on inside the tank. Um, you know, these guys are always up on their, their OSHA and their safety. So they're going to make those, re those recommendations too. Um, and, you know, you can pretty much take, you know, a well done inspection report, um, and, and build a project right off of that. It's really, really helpful to have. Hey, here's a question. What if you have a really poorly done inspection report, then what do you do? Then you should just bid the project using that. <laughs> Sorry. Don't so even that's, an write the that's an earlier conversation, Christine and I <laughs> had. Uh, no, no, you should. Uh, yeah, the, the better the information, the more comprehensive the information, the better. Um, you know, on the concrete tank side, you know, Joe's service group is fantastic on the t t concrete tanks. You know, we had them out to do to do an assessment on a concrete tank, um, and wow, we get, we got a lot more information than we bargained for. So, um, you know, again, get with the guys who, who, who do this for a living um, and, and, and get a professional assessment of what, what you're looking at. Yeah, because like for me, there's nothing worse than an owner who's like, hey, had an inspection done, here's the report, can you write specs for me? And I look at it and I'm thinking, there's no dimensions, there's no photos inside. There's well, there's a lot of people, there's a, there, there are a few co companies out there that do them as a favor I, mm -hmm. or for, like you have to see what else are, what yeah. else are they selling you are they yeah. trying to sell you a tank rehab are they trying well, to sell you a maintenance program or is all they do inspections so right and, so and also you know, to, if you get to see a full uh, a really good inspection report and then compare it then you realize what you're missing and what you get you get your money's worth right absolutely uh -huh. jamie yeah to that to that point about the inspection report um, with the way technology is now and how prices have come down, like if you don't have good, clear color photos of your interior, that's a, that's a red flag that, you know, you're not getting what you should be in, a, in an inspection report. You know, obviously all the data and, and the, you know, the written report is important too, but um, I just, you know, I see some specs come through and see the report. And I'm like, this is terrible. This is like, you know, are these photos 30 years old, but, you know, just, it, it's just a reflection of how fast technology has improved, but, you know, homeowner grade, um, you know, cameras would be an improvement on some, on some inspection report photos I see. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just saying it's, 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 you know, I, I think it's just uh, so important to have that, um, you know, so that, you know, if we're sitting in an office or reading a specification that's, you know, put out to bid, um, you know, you don't have to go back and make a second site visit just because the report isn't informative enough. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Ralph. Yeah. Just to speak on that a little bit, uh, because we have varying different styles of tanks, right? We have some welded steel, we have uh, several concrete, we have several uh, bolted glass line tanks from like a mid Atlantic storage style tank. Uh, all of those companies inspect their tanks a little bit differently but they all provide uh, very detailed inspection reports. So when we bid the project, 95% of the time, the contractors don't even come out to do a pre-bid visual because the inspection report is so well done. Uh, that in conjunction with the specifications, if everything's detailed and pictures are there, uh, I give them a, a GIS coordinate that they pull up on Google Earth and they can see an overview where they're, where they're gonna have lay down area. And, uh, uh, in a COVID day and age where you can't really see people face to face anyway, it's it's extremely helpful. Uh, yeah. and, and I think that just speaks to what Jamie was mentioning about the pictures and about uh, you'd rather have more information than less. And, and I see a comment just came through that the value of the inspection report far outweighs the cost, which uh, as an owner, I mean, we inspect 75 tanks a year minimum. And absolutely. Yeah, we, we get a we get our pennies worth. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's right, Kim. Or Kim Mazer. Yep. <laughs> Kim's seen all the good and the bad when it comes to um, tank inspection reports. Nick, you had a comment? Well, even if the client doesn't want to pay for a comprehensive inspection, 
we tend to get the data anyways, because what happens at the end of the day, they're going to need it. So I don't want to spread that word out there, but uh, you know, you do need that comprehensive, no matter who it is, you either pay then or you pay later with change orders, delays, and we know how important it is taking tanks out during the high season. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So a reminder to our audience, we're taking questions from you guys throughout. Uh, so use the Q&A button, please, and uh, submit some. So uh, here's another one from Kim Mazur at NTEC. When a steel tank is repainted, what is the expected life of the new coating system? So um, Ralph, you were saying you're looking like 25, 30 years before you have to fully blast it and repaint it, or what are you seeing? Yeah, we. Uh, it was funny. Uh, Rob was just mentioning that the outside of the tank isn't always indicative of the inside of the tank. And, and we had a project like that up in Warren, Pennsylvania, that the outside of the tank was a complete eyesore. I mean, it, it looked weathered, it looked terrible. And our customers were calling us saying, hey, how's my water quality? But if you look at the inside and you look at the photos of the inside coating, it was, it was perfect. And, and the tank coating system was 25 years old. So uh, with the new coating systems, Every paint manufacturer will tell you that they're going to get 25 to 30 years, depending on how Jamie and his crew apply their coating system. <laughs> um, but that's what we've been expecting. And, you know, when, when we budget and we put out projections, uh, we budget 25 years bad lifespan, 30 years good lifespan. Okay. Uh, Rob? Uh, a project Nick and I worked on uh, this past year, actually, the contractor, I was talking to him. Um, and he told me that they had a they had an issue with an interior high solids coating um, where where something was off with their mixture and it wouldn't meet NSF. So they had to blast it off. He said they spent a 12 hour shift and they got about the size of the hood of a truck blasted off the side of that tank. So oh. I, I think it's going to be interesting to see. I, I, I think that's a question that that I don't think we I don't think we know. I think people were saying 25, 30. I think some are even pushing out pretty much further than that. It's going to be really interesting to see what these interior, you know, if they're prepped well um, and they're applied correctly, I think the, the, the new lifespans of these coatings are going to last a lot longer than yeah. people expect. Yeah, I mean, we could see 30, 40, 50 and just do, you know, spot repairs here and there because right. that's that, way easier to do that than, <laughs> Jamie, have you tried blasting the um, thick coatings off before? Yes, and... Uh, with, uh, with with if you were conventionally blasting with uh, you know disposable media, yeah, you, it would take forever. With with uh, steel grit, it's definitely faster, but it's um, extremely durable. I'll put it that way. <laughs> okay. uh, in, interesting to segue off of Rob's comment about, or yeah, Rob's comment about uh, the outside reflecting the inside. Um, we have a tank local to us that. Uh, the inside we coated, we did the entire tank, I think back in 1987, and the interior is still that original paint job. The exterior has been overcoated two other times in that time period, just because of weathering and older paint systems, you know, not, not handling the uh, UV exposure. But yeah, that's, that's the oldest one I know of that we still have a tank in service. You know, and I'm kind of like, when's this going to come out for bid again? <laughs> but, uh, so far, it hasn't happened. It's a public water tank. Well, it stinks when you do a really good job, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, speaking of tanks that don't look so good on the outside, um, I also had a client who sent me an inspection report. Outside looked terrible, but on the inside, not so bad. And here's the thing. It was way back in the woods. No one could see it. And actually, when I look closely at the photos, it wasn't rusting on the outside. It had been overcoated. There was some paint peeling. But when it came to actual rust, and actually, when it comes to rehabbing, rust. When you see rust, at least on the steel tanks, that's when it's time to consider, the, or usually time to consider rehabbing it. If you're simply seeing red primer, good. <laughs> the steel's still protected in those cases. Granted, you may need some OSHA upgrades or some other stuff, but the structure is still is typically still in good condition. Uh, would you agree, Nick, from what you've seen out there? Yeah, I mean, once they got rid of lead, it was a challenge to replace a primer that worked that well. And so I think finally, after 50 years, they're finally come to a point, and I guess the paint manufacturer could attest to this, the lead was incredible. We were in a tank, and speaking of life expectancy internally, and a tank in West Virginia, it was done in the 50s, and the outside looked bad. We went inside and looked great. 
from the 50s. And then how is that even possible? Well, it was lead. It was a lead coated tank and it held up, you know, this is probably about eight years ago. It held up that long. So, to, to, you know, the approach to a lot of these uh, is based on budget too. I mean, we didn't bring up the word budget, but um, approaching these tanks, we typically want to, you know, I like to ask clients, when are you retiring? How long do you want it to last? Because if they don't have the money, we want to at least get it past their retirement. So we go with an approach of good, better, best. And we know that there are a lot of different coatings out there in different generic systems and they're starting to get kept, you know, get caught up in the old days. We even put the thermal spray zinc inside tanks and um, they still don't need touched up after 40 years and 50 years. And I don't know that a lot of states approve thermal spray zinc, but there's an example if you want to do your tank once in a lifetime, but again, it doesn't always meet NSF depending on the state you're in. So the first question we like to ask, you know, is budget. And then went back, we brought up, I think one of the panels brought up overcoating. And there are a lot of candidates for overcoating, but you know, in life expectancy, they have to be aware you're not getting 30 years out of an overcoat. Very likely you're gonna get about half or better. Yeah, good point. Uh, any other comments when it comes to um, tank rehabs and when the right time is to do them? Okay, do you know I'm gonna go back to our audience. Reminder, uh, submit questions through the Q&A. And um, <laughs> here's an oddball one from Patrick Burke. <laughs> so what's the weirdest thing that you ever found inside of a water tank during a rehab project? So I don't need y'all to answer. And I know the weirdest thing I ever found inside a water tank down the Jersey shore. My inspector called me, it was Memorial Day weekend. And he's like, hey, if you're in so-and-so town, don't drink the water. Like, what do you mean? They had repainted it, birds had gotten inside and there was two feet of pigeon crap in the bottom of the tank. And they wow. were drinking that water. So that's the, well, weird and grossest thing I ever saw. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, can we leave the names of the client customers out of these ones, please? Oh, yeah, yeah. This is the one where you don't want to talk about the clients. <laughs> and here's the thing. Often they don't know. So it's not really their fault. Uh, they just, you know, it speaks to the uh, incredible importance of regular inspections and looking inside. So, um, so <laughs> Jamie, what about you? Yeah, birds are birds are really the biggest offender, whether it's feces or dead birds themselves that's really the biggest thing so like that's weird to the everyday person but to me unfortunately it's not weird because we see it too often um you know when it comes to you know vents and overflow pipes are usually the biggest places uh, where birds get in or really old style tanks that have uh you know unsealed roof overhangs or you know something like that going on um the other thing as far as weird uh probably the the oddest thing that i've seen is um, wooden uh, pipe supports inside a tank uh, where the pipes going across the floor were supported with, it appeared to be railroad ties bolted together and then they were painted. <laughs> and um, that was the, you know, as far as weird, uh, I'm not sure who and why and all that, but. Because uh, they had them and it was cheap. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> So the, the pipes were crib, basically cribbed in place and bolted with uh, huge bolts. I mean, anyway, I believe we took all that out of there and replaced it with steel pipe supports. But <laughs> oh, I love it. Love it. <laughs> Joe. Yeah, um, a coworker of mine, who he's based um, uh, in Texas, he was uh, recently out looking at a tank as a candidate for a rehab. And he had kind of a funny story. It's a, a smaller system. And um, to operate their tank, basically, they had a float set up inside of the tank. And when the tank would fill up, it would basically turn on a red light bulb in their office. Someone would walk over and turn off the pump so the tank would stop filling. And when the light bulb would go off, they'd go turn that pump back on. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I'd never really seen anything so, you know, simple and rudimentary before, but that was, that was kind of cool. <laughs> That was wild. <laughs> okay, uh, next question from our audience. Uh, are you seeing surface maintenance contracts coming from the tank manufacturer are mostly third-party tank service companies. So um, I, I know the answer, but I'd love to hear from the panel. What are you guys seeing out there? Uh, I'd, I'd say yes. I'd say yes to both. Uh, for, for somebody like a mid-Atlantic service company who builds their own um, tanks, they also like to be the ones that maintain them. 
which makes sense because they know their product best and they uh, they know the sealant to use. They know how to rehab a tank like that. But uh, steel water tanks, once uh, uh, a new manufacturer comes in and builds the tank, any painter, uh, knock on wood, within reason, would do the same uh, paint job that their in-house crews make. I think the same goes for folks like, you know, Joe's group, same, same thing. That was kind of exactly what I was thinking, Ralph. Yeah, and it's interesting yet when it comes to the steel tank guys, uh, Jamie, like they, like if they build a tank, none of them do repairs, do them? Do they? I don't, I or think. they might have dabbled in it. Like if they've got their own painting crew, they may have said, yes, we're doing a tank maintenance program now for people. And then it's gotta be I, like the only thing you're doing or it won't work. I feel like they're set up for the erection and the heavy construction side more than for like the maintenance stuff like James. Yeah, I've had a couple of those firms recently reach out to us specifically, uh, basically saying, hey, we have holes in our schedule the next couple of years, uh, whether it's due to budget or whether it's just due to, you know, no new tanks going up or whatever the case may be. Hey, if you have any rehab projects, we may be interested now, uh, you know, from an owner's perspective. I, it's not that I don't trust them because I know that they can build a new tank, but rehabbing a tank often has its own nuances that building a new one would not. It always has nuances. <laughs> you Are you smiling, uh, Rob, because you've been through that? <laughs> <laughs> it's always an adventure. <laughs> uh, here's an interesting question from Tori Morgan with Entech. Um, have you guys noticed that any any climate change or has climate change uh, shown any sort of trending when it comes to the uh, life of tanks? And um, so, anyone seeing when with climate change, you know, hotter winters, more cold snaps? Um, any anyone I, anyone seeing anything detrimental when it comes to the lifespan of the tanks? The, nothing yet. Okay. Uh, Interesting question. I just say, I would say that uh, our tanks that are tucked away behind trees or in a better location rather than on a hillside seem mm -hmm. less weathering, uh, but they then, then tend to get more mold and more discoloration just from vegetation than anything else. But because, I mean, if you had a paint manufacturer, they would tell you their painting systems have improved drastically as well. So they're, they're designed with your environment in mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah so I would point. say I would say no, but then again, this year in Pennsylvania, we may only get a four month painting season with the way the weather's going. So who knows? But what about last year? Wasn't last year better? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I like, uh, I, yeah, I, I'm constantly watching the weather. I'm like, can they paint? Can they paint? Can they paint? Jamie, you're dealing with that every day, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, the, uh, this year is like, oh, we're back to a normal winter. Whereas the past couple was like, we're, you know, we're containing and, and kind of rolling right through, maybe stop for a week or two for the worst cold and the worst snow, if we got snow. But this year is like kind of a little bit of a reality check uh, that it is actually February. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a part of me is like, this sucks. And I think, well, yeah, it's winter. <laughs> or when I call Joe's guys and I'm like, Joe, I have a leaky concrete tank. Can you can you help me out here? And he's like, not this week. No, not this week. <laughs> Joe, when it comes to cold weather like we're seeing right now, do you end up having more leaks in the concrete tanks? Um, what do you see? No, I mean usually not. Not. I mean, you know, you the the cold weather can can cause you know a freeze thaw cycle to happen in in concrete, which can lead to cracking and spalling. But um, no, it typically don't don't the cold doesn't typically create more. You know. Um, but you know, it, it sometimes it can um, identify an area where, if you have a slow, you know, uh, some seepage through a concrete wall or through something that a lot of times may not be evident. If it's a, a warmer or windy day, it, it it might evaporate prior to showing it, or maybe it's faint enough where you don't see it. You might see some ice accumulation, and, and sometimes that can be an indication of something that is starting to occur. Okay, excellent. Okay, yeah, another question from our audience. Here's a fun one. It's mainly because I love painting murals on tanks or logos or signs and that sort of thing. In fact, Rob just sent out an email today in regards to a logo on the side of a tank. So the question is, uh, when it comes to painting a mural or a logo or something on a tank, how hard is it? Like what things do you have to put in, into consideration? So 
Rob, do you want to touch on this? Uh, you know, our, our biggest challenge in getting logos on some of the tanks that we've done has been local permitting. Um, you know, a lot of times the zoning, uh, there's zoning regulations that limit what you can or can't do. Um, you know, I, I was actually shocked. Um, the first logo that I saw actually applied. Um, I was surprised. I was amazed at how quickly it went on. Um, you know, there's guy again. There, there are experts out there that do this, and wow, it was incredible to watch them how they did it and how they worked to get it done. So um, now, as far as murals, that that's a little bit of a different game, I think. And uh, yeah, I mean, you take you you take the effort and and the expense you would have on painting a mural on the ground, and then you put it high in the air. Yeah, it's, it would be it would be a challenge for sure. Yeah, um, Jamie, you guys would you 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 wouldn't even consider painting a huge huge mural in a tank, would you? I, we don't have any experience with it. The 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 closest thing to that was a, uh, a local customer who had us do some very fancy script lettering, and you know it was I think. 50 feet long and 20 feet tall and had banners and all kinds of, you know, fan, like a flourish and all kinds of things that had to do with their company logo. Um, you know, that was, that was difficult enough. It was like too big to get a stencil made. So it was actually, uh, we had an old school sign painter come in and freehand the whole thing. Oh my God. Uh, but most of the time we use this, you know, it's most of the time ours is limited to, you know, wording and a symbol or something like that. And, you know, a couple colors, um, nothing that's nothing that I would call artistic. Uh, that would scare me, really. <laughs> so well, thing, you know what you can do, and you know what you can't do. So uh, there's a, a tank painter. His name is Eric Hen. He's been at it for dozens of years. Gorgeous murals and, and underwater scenes, and it's it's a piece of art. Yeah. That's who you hire <laughs> if you want it done right. Then <laughs> you get someone like that. Um, but speaking from experience and having seen a lot of bad um, logos on tanks, do a mock-up first. Um, tanklogos.com. <laughs> There's a guy down in Florida. And he'll do it for a few hundred dollars. He'll give you a mock-up. He'll tell you the colors, the size. He'll get you a template, everything you need to make sure it looks right. And here's the thing. When you see the mock-up, you'll realize, well, unless I get that close, I can't, I can't even read it. So imagine if you're standing on the ground across the street looking at it you're not going to be able to read it so size bigger is better and sometimes even that doesn't help <laughs> okay so more questions from our audience a reminder once again we're taking q a from you guys throughout so tax thank you so much for submitting a question um, when you budget the timing for painting do you consider overcoating and um so i guess he's saying when you're uh, <laughs> i'm not sure what he means <laughs> painting do you consider overcoating and maybe he means like if you're looking at the time period of 30 years for lifespan does that include at some point overcoating the tank Ralph what would you say um yeah I, I kind of read his question more in in line of okay if I only have six months to paint this tank do I look at overcoating to save me some time mm -hmm. um yes and no so uh, a reason I would say no is because what we've found when we bid projects is that when we bid, if they're coming into, if we're hiring Jamie's company to come in and rehab the inside of the tank, most of the equipment is also there to repaint the exterior of the tank. So for the small cost that we're saving of just an overcoating, I would much rather uh, pay an additional amount to get a longer lifespan from that exterior coating as well. And I think Nick touched on this earlier you know, overcoating won't necessarily give you the best bang for your buck. It's an option and it might get you through what you need to do. Um, but when you're already paying the mobilization costs for all the rest of the equipment to come out, uh, unless you're only doing the exterior, sometimes it makes sense to just pull, pull board, do them both at once. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and you know, a lot, of, a lot of people I work with, I mean, budget's always a challenge, right? Having the money to do a project this is all, like this is already is always a challenge. Um, having the budget to do an overcoat, you know, most of them would prefer, prefer to just do the job, you know, hold off if they got to hold off a year to get a little bit more together to do it. Um, you know, I, Christine, you, we've had some luck with, with just cleaning, cleaning the exterior of a tank and, 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 you know, we've had some, you know, amazing makeovers 
with a, with a little bit of pressure washing and a and a and a JOG lift. So. Yeah, and speaking of that, uh, in particular, uh, Joe Papa was uh, his firm was out doing a tank rehab for one of my clients, and the outside looked bad: concrete tank, uh, efflorescence, and just staining all over. They did a couple swipes with their pressure washer, and I swear to God, it looked new. <laughs> and wow, that's all you need. <laughs> so particularly, so what was that? There's like so many of our projects where the crew, you know, gets the tank cleaned and the owner comes out and says, you look, it looks great. You guys did a great job. And we're like, well, no, we're not done yet. We haven't painted it yet. <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, there's a, there's quite a bit of accumulation over the years. You know, it's like, it's like if you didn't wash your car for five or 10 years, how would it look? You know, you have, you know washing every five or, or like 10 years can really make a huge improvement. No, that's a great, um, <laughs> a great analogy. Um, is it is pressure washing the outside of the tank? Is that something owners can do themselves? And if so, like, what's too much pressure? Is there a, like a, a sweet spot? Yeah, I mean, we typically recommend between three and five thousand psi. Um, you know, using a rotary tip nozzle just helps with effectiveness. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, owners can absolutely do it. What happens? What happens a lot of times is just what happens often is that someone will ask me for a price to go out and wash one of their tanks. And I'll give it to them and they'll have a little bit of sticker shock mm -hmm. and then they'll go out and do it themselves and realize that it does take a long time. It's not just like rinsing down the tank. It's like back and forth, you know, swipe by swipe. And they, and they lose a crew of a couple people out there for a week or two. And then I, I see them, you know, after, and I say, yeah, it, it, it looks great. And he's like, yeah, now I know why it was so much money. Like it took mm -hmm. us a month to like clean the thing, you, you know, Yes, they can absolutely do it, but there is a commitment involved in it. Good points. Okay, and uh, yes, Nick, go ahead. And, and when we're on the subject of overcoating, it's important to know the adhesion characteristics before you do that, so that you don't schedule a, an overcoat job and it starts peeling off and now you have big trouble. So always wanna know what the adhesion uh, characteristics are before you commit to an overcoat. And that would be not like you, you do it's the touch. adhesion, it, it's not, three years beforehand it's like a couple months before you're going to do it so like in the right time frame to know that you can do yeah, it you can do an x cut or a cross cut either and depending on film thickness and then if it's uh you know some of the more critical projects military base you may even glue on some dollies if it matters so there's three approaches to that but you're going to need all you need you learn all you need on an overcoat on an x cut and a cross cut yeah and don't count on one location Make sure it's in several locations because you'll notice what a great job painters do in the lower elevations. Uh -huh. Or off to the sides of the ladder. Yeah, and <laughs> arms reach, always great. <laughs> Nothing personal, I, that, I don't mean it directly, but just things that you encounter. <laughs> uh, would you want back to that original uh, poll that we took with our audience, uh, their second biggest question was when it comes to permitting. What's needed? How long is it going to take? So when it comes to potable water tanks, well, I guess there's a difference. Potable water tanks, you've got to get a permit from the Pennsylvania DEP. If it's a fire protection tank, well, then I guess it ties in with NFPA or your fire marshal or whatever requirements they may have. Uh, but let's, I guess let's start with a potable water tank. So Ralph, what kind of permits do you guys need? Sure. Yeah, I always uh, always find it interesting when somebody comes to me, let's say this month in February, and they say, I'd like to paint a tank later this year. Uh, you know, how do I do it? <laughs> and I'm going to say, do you mean later next year? Because uh, typically you, you have about a year and a half cycle uh, minimum from starting a tank project to finishing a tank project because uh, you initially budget, you know, you get an inspection and then you get a budget uh, dollar amount from that inspection and then you put the project out for bid. And while you're going through all that, you put together a permit based off of your specifications that you have developed and you send it to the DEP. And depending on whether it's a minor or major permit through the DEP, uh, it could be six months to a year of review and, and any sort of back and forth uh, with the DEP. Um, when you submit the permit, you want to make sure there's a couple things that you include. Uh, these are these are huge things that the DEP looks for. You need the engineering narrative to explain uh, how you're going to run your water system without your water tank. So are you going to use another pump station? Are you going to use a treatment plant? And then you're also going to want to include any NSF or uh, 
uh, coding information uh, about the codings that you plan to use. I know those are two big things that DEP has been asking for, especially the last few years, which I think uh, any novice out there that may be starting this, they, they may not have those in their back pocket. So I know somebody like Rob, uh, you know, with the Beaver Falls, which is near to my house, he's worked with them on a lot of their tank rehabs, and I'm sure that's something he's included in all of his permits. So once you go through that permitting process, you're, you're already a, a six months to a year into your, your timeline, and then you start to work, and Jamie's crew comes in, and you have three to four months of tank rehab, depending on the size of the tank, and then you get your tank filled up, water quality samples taken, and then you still have to wait on the regulating agency again to give you approval to put the tank back in service, which could be another couple weeks to a month, depending on uh, uh, how you're sampling and how, how the feedback is. So it's, uh, it's always longer than what people think it'll be, that's for sure. Bravo. That, that answer, that, that's gold. <laughs> <laughs> Put that on YouTube, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already thinking that. <laughs> Rob, anything else from the engineer slash owner perspective that you can share with what you're seeing? Yeah, the answer to how long it's going to take is always longer than I think. Um, <laughs> it, uh, <laughs> it particularly now, particularly now, uh, you know, I, I, you know, the, 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 the folks that work for the DEP work, at, you know, they're an extension of the governor's office. And, and, you know, I, I, quite frankly, I feel for those folks right now. I can't believe I actually said that out loud <laughs> in a public forum and forum, but, um, you know, they are, uh, they are, they are struggling to get the, their work done now. Um, they have the same workload they had before. Um, and, and yet they're all working remotely and sorting through how to make that stuff work. Um, and, and it's been, there's, there's quite a learning curve. A lot of the, there was, there's been a good bit of turnover in the department lately. And so you got a lot of new people who are again working remotely. Um, it, it, it's been a struggle to get permits lately from from those folks. So you know, Ralph said uh, six months to a year. Um, you know, two years ago, I'd say yeah, it's probably that's probably extensive. Now six months to a year, unfortunately. But yeah, no, just, no, he, just to get he, a permit, just to get the permit from the just DEC. to get the permit. Yeah, it, it takes that long, um, just w given the circumstances. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, he hit on all the high points. You know, one of the things. Um, you talk about how, how, how these projects go, you know, one of the projects we're working on right now, Christine, is the, is the, another tank in Beaver Falls where, you know, mm -hmm. just to paint the tank, we have to bring in temporary storage. So, you know, there's a whole nother dynamic to a project that, you know, meeting with property owners and citing temporary storage and figuring out how that whole thing is going to work and then presenting it to a D, to the DEP in a, in a, in a way that they can understand and approve. Oh. Um, you know, it's a, it's a whole nother set of challenges we're adding into, into the mix. Yeah. Now, I guess, Jamie, over, um, over time, has your crew been delayed? Like you've gotten a contract, you're ready to go, and the owner doesn't have the DEP permit yet? Does that ever happen? Uh, yeah, we're experiencing that right now. We had a project scheduled for last fall, and I think we were, we were like a week before our pre-con and they said, can we reschedule the pre-con for spring? We realized we don't have permits. So uh, I'm still waiting for the permits. <laughs> so yes. <laughs> yeah, that's, 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 a that's a current situation. Like that's, that's what we're experiencing right now. So uh, yeah, it's happened before though too. Um, you know, normal delays or everything's go and it's, you know, waiting for a final review and okay. often, often having to do with the temporary water uh, mm -hmm. plan too. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Well, do you know what? We're going to play a special game right now. So just so the audience knows my panel doesn't know what's going to happen next. <laughs> so what we're going to do is play a game I'm calling tank trivia. Ding! Thank trivia. Okay, so here is the trivia question to my panel. How tall is the tallest water tank in the in oh, don't look, don't look. <laughs> How tall is the tallest water tank in the United States? So I'll go around the panel. Um, in feet, give me how tall you think it is. So Rob, what do you think? How tall is the tallest uh, water tank in the United States? This is why you wouldn't share with us what the question was going to be because you knew we'd look it up. Well, yes, I did. Um, I have no idea. 200 feet? 200 feet. Okay. Jamie, give me your guess. Uh, I think it's 330. 330? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Joe, what do you think? Uh, I was going to say 175. 
175. And you know what? I'm also going to um, can I do that? I'm going to poll our audience, and because I'd love to hear from the audience, what do you guys think out there? Uh, anyone have any idea? With tank trivia: How tall is the tallest water tank in the United States? So, got five different options there. Oh shoot! Well, now the panel's seeing some of this. <laughs> <laughs> I know what my guess is, 315. <laughs> so Nick, Nick, what's your guess? 315. 315. And Ralph, what's your guess? Well, since Jamie said 330, I'm going to do the price is right rule and go 331. That way I cover <laughs> anything higher than 330. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's almost like you've played this game before and you actually haven't because I just made this game up. <laughs> I knew if I was going to be last, I was going to price is right and either go one higher or just one and just well, take it. You can have what's behind curtain number one if you want to change your answer. <laughs> okay, so we'll give the audience five more seconds to chime in with how tall is the tallest tank in the United States. And if we end the polling now, I'll share the results. So their guess, and granted some of them may know, uh, they thought it was 315 feet high. Uh, here's the thing, if you were guessing 350, that was the answer, and I can sh show you the tank itself. So um, big thank you to um, Callbell Tanks, uh, Maria Bowman. She couldn't send me actual pictures, but Caldwell was down at Cape Canaveral, it would have been, wait, what year are we in? 2021. 2020, last summer. Um, their foreman, Lonnie Lund, was down and built this. 350 feet plus, she says. Can't give me any details other than it's big. <laughs> so you'll see a lot of these really, really tall elevated tanks at um, places where they the space shuttle blasts off and rockets and that sort of thing. Um, any of you guys in my audience know why they have a high volume of water up so high with big pipes going to the landing pad? Anyone know the answer to that? Very flat My understanding land. is it gets, the rock is really, really hot and like burning everything up as it launches. So you need to flood the area with water to cool it down. So that's the background behind those tanks. So thank you for playing. Congratulations, Ralph. I'll send you a crown very shortly. Oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> you got to wear it on the next panel. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I'll be sick that day. Uh, maybe maybe yeah. you could send it to Jamie instead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, here's a good question that actually ties in with um, one of the third items that our, our um, audience was very curious about. So when considering a rehab, what are best practices if the interior of the tank contains lead in the coating? The lead in the coating on the interior. So Nick, what do you usually recommend for something like that? Well, depends on where it's located. Let's start with that. But the actual tank itself serves as a containment. So with proper air, uh, negative air and uh, pers personal air monitors, you can pull it off with uh, n not really an issue internally, as long as you seal up your ports and have proper ventilation and safety measures for the workers. It really is the exterior that's a big problem with lead. The only problem on the internal is that you're drinking lead-based water and you know, water quality concerns. Mm -hmm. So Ralph, um, do you guys still have lead on any of your tanks or is it pretty much, or I guess it's acquisitions where you'd see them, right? Correct. Yeah. With uh, the size of our company, you know, when, when we acquire new systems is usually when we find something like that. Uh, however, because of how long it's been since lead coatings have been allowed on the interior of tanks, I would say that I haven't seen lead on an interior coating in quite some time. Um, every now and then we'll still have it on the exterior coating. And then we would have somebody like Jamie's crew come in and, and uh, you know, full containment and make sure that, that it's contained and disposed of, uh, you know, with proper measures, whether it's has waste or whether, you know, we have to go through DEP for approval, things like that. Uh, we typically leave that in their hands, you know, make sure that's covered in our specifications, make sure it's bid correctly and uh, make sure they're aware of it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I would say that to any, any owner out there, is your specifications up front, making the contractor aware of that during bid is your number one thing. So you're not hit with a change order at the 11th hour. And when you say making them aware, would you say there's these, 
um, I have them in my car. These little swabs that you crush the crystal thing and then you swab it on and it tells you if you have lead or not. Is that, is that, does that work? Is that good? Uh, we, we typically would have somebody like Nick's firm out and they would test it for us and tell us the exact percentage of lead that is in, in the interior and exterior coatings. And it's not only lead, we also look for chromium and we look for cadmium as well, uh, just to verify that any, any of those heavy metals are made aware to our contractors. Uh, not only for, for sanitary reasons and, and environmental reasons, but also just for safety reasons for their workers and for our folks as well. Yep, good point. Yeah, Nick? Can I, just one oversight related to blasting on lead, it applies more externally, but um, you just don't want to do a commercial blast externally. You want, when you're doing, dealing with lead, make sure you remove it all because you'll run into specifications that'll a commercial blast lead why would you leave any on it? Not that the standards, it'll still meet standards, but you don't know what's gonna change five or 10 years from now. And then at that point, you just create a higher profile. So you have to make sure your primer can handle the higher profile when you're removing the lead. Mm -hmm. Good point. Yeah, Jamie? Uh, yeah, to the lead testing issue, um, kind of back to inspection reports. I've seen some inspection reports come through and you know it was noted that uh, the inspector was not authorized to remove samples from the tank to test for lead. And, you know, I would, I would advise any owner to, yes, definitely authorize the inspection company to remove samples if, there's a, if that's suspected, because having that information up front um, is much, you know, it's, it's, better, it's better to know that up front. So like Ralph said, there's not a change order. Um, you know, we're in a project right now where that was the situation. And, you know, I was you know, suspecting that it might be an issue, but pre-contract, we weren't authorized to test. And that just seems very counterproductive, you know, in the long run to, uh, for the owner, because it's kind of like you start the job, you know, you mobilize, you start the job and then you test for lead and then decide it's lead and then adjust all the pricing and then move forward. And it's, you know, it's just, um, that information could have been known years before. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And yeah. like, if you have an inspection report done, say, 10 years ago, they grab samples and you see the lead, chromium, cadmium, you don't need to do it then 10 years later when your tank needs to be painted. As long as it's done once and you keep those records, or right. if you know the tank inspector and they're good friends of yours, you can go back to them and say, hey, give me that, in or can I please have that inspection report or just the lead, lead uh, reports? So that can be very helpful later. Uh, Rob? I don't remember this, the, the circumstances around it, but I've had situations where we, we didn't have uh, sampling on the inside of the tank and we just specified it, assume it's lead. Because again, the containment's already there. So now you're basically dealing with a, with a containment issue or a, a ventilation issue more than anything else. So you know, we, we, we've done it that way too, where, and I, again, I don't remember the circumstances as to why we couldn't get access to get a good sample, but, but we've just made this statement in the spec, just assume it's lead. Yeah. Yeah, and you know what? It's been so long since I didn't have it that I forgot. Right, and I, I, I don't remember, like I said, I wish I could remember the circumstances <laughs> as to why we couldn't get a sample inside, but there was some reason we couldn't. So many tanks, so little time. Yes, Nick? <laughs> yeah, and to Rob's point, you still have to have the waste sampled anyway. So even if you treated it, it's, it's got to be classified before it leaves the site. So, it, it, you know, it's already contained. It just, it's for more of the worker's safety to let them know that they have eye wash, hand wash, decon trailer. Th those are important factors if you got lead. So you should know. And the worker needs to know if he's dealing with it. Yeah, yeah, good point. Uh, Jim Willard hit something in our in our chat side there too, Christine. What did Jim have to say? A... Oh, in the chat. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, Jim says, what about residual lead in the soils from past paint removal work at old tank sites? Uh, do you ever have to do Im uh, implement soils remediation as part of a tank rehab project? So uh, I have an answer, but uh, Ralph, any of you guys ever deal with soil remediation in any of these sites? We, we have not. Uh, okay. you know, even through our acquisitions, uh, not that I'm aware of, I'll put it that way. Okay. Uh, so Nick, what have you seen? Pre and post soil are standard on any lead job for us. And then if they go and we give them an allowance that they're allowed to go above and below, because there's probably already lead there. We just got to establish a baseline and find out how much it increased, if any. That's, and then you can put a mitigation plan together. Yep. Yeah. And we ran into that with the client where um, actually it was a tank demo. And um, when they, <laughs> we had them take pre and post soil samples 
and it was high. And I'm like, huh, well, I know it wasn't the demo guys who got it high because it was high to begin with. I'm like, I wonder what you do. And it turns out NTech has this like, environmental scientist guy. <laughs> so uh, one of my coworkers, Jason Book, he's like, yeah, I know what to do. I'm like, okay, come talk to my clients. <laughs> and it's cool because he, there's special gizmos. He went out, he took samples at various levels uh, in depth down to 18 inches and got some immediate sort of ballpark result for how much lead was in the soil. And it turns out it was right around the tank base. And actually some of it was adhered to the foundation, which makes no sense because how would it get along the foundation? It was, it was weird. But anyway, the owner dug away all that soil. I think they dug it themselves and just put some stone in. And uh, so, I mean, it's not cheap, but it can easily be done. I mean, I think the overall cost for everything was ten thousand dollars but hey we know lead won't get into the drinking water and they've taken care of it and then it's done now so very very good question thank you jim um more questions from the audience and uh, here's an interesting one um so joe when it comes to concrete tanks they're typically like not painted on the inside especially the potable water ones um, so the, the question is when it comes to rehabbing, like what's the difference between rehabbing a concrete tank and rehabbing a steel tank? And I guess the number one difference would be a concrete tank, you're not repainting because it hadn't been painted to begin with. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. I mean, the, the, um, the coatings are sometimes required as part of the rehab, usually to, uh, to address a specific concern. It's not to say stop a future concern like corrosion, but maybe a current concern like a, you know, a construction joint that is leaking or a floor that's settling and has cracks in it. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, usually like we have a problem and we're going to utilize a coating to solve that problem rather than use it as like a preventative maintenance type. type mm -hmm. item. Okay. And then I guess with the older concrete tanks, um, accessories that are on the tank, such as uh, ladders, handrails, that sort of stuff, if it doesn't meet OSHA requirements, you guys can upgrade that as part of the rehab. Is that something you normally do? Absolutely. Yeah. So like whenever we go out and, you know, whether we're doing an inspection or just like, you know, an informal visit or we're helping an engineer or an owner put together a project, we always try to comment on some of those like common things like venting and hatches and access, OSHA requirements, tank mixing, all the things that change with requirements, OSHA requirements, um, you know, all, all those different things because nothing lasts forever. Right. And, you know, whether it's the overflow rules are changing or the size of the screen and the vent test to change and they want to upgrade to a frost-free vent, you know, all relatively simple items that can be bolted on, but it makes sense to do them as part of the bigger rehab project because you already have the crew there, you already have the access there. A lot of times, you, you know, you might be getting some type of a loan or funding for that project that allows you to roll this cost over a much longer period rather than pay out of your, like, out of your, like, current budget. Um, so all, all good things to consider. Yeah. Okay. Um, you brought up uh, the idea of putting mixers in tanks. So we had this fun, fun mixer uh, panel, uh, water tank mixing with uh, Rob and Ralph. If you want to catch it, it's on our YouTube channel. Uh, so when it comes to mixers, uh, Rob, what are you seeing when you're rehabbing tanks? How often is either an active mixer or a passive mixer or uh, some sort of new mixing put into the tank? What do you see? You know, it's, it's, it's changed over the spread of my career, but you know, it, it, we don't do a tank project anymore without discussing uh, mixing. Um, you know, whether it gets done or not, you know, I, I'd say it's probably more often than not we do something, um, whether it be an active mixer or something just as simple as, as an inlet outlet separator, like a, an internal piping type of modification. Mm -hmm. um, I, more often than not, we're doing something. But water quality is such a, so much more of a concern now. Um, and, and a lot of these tanks, I mean, we're, we're, we're painting tanks that exist, right? Um, and, and the previous um, philosophy in, in, in designing tanks was bigger the better. Um, and now with the water quality regulations changing the way they have, um, you know, that's, that's not necessarily the, the, the best way to look at things anymore. So, you know, we're, a lot of times we're looking at things that were, were built bigger is better and, um, and needing to correct something uh, that, that maybe at the time made a lot of sense um, mm -hmm. and, and it did make a lot of sense at the time, but, but current, you know, current philosophy, current approaches to water quality dictates that you have to do something to, to, to improve the turnover in your tanks. Yeah. Good point. Uh, Jamie, when you're out there rehabbing tanks, how often are you putting in mixers? 
Um, I'd say at least over 50% of the time, a mixer is going in, whether it's being put in by a third party or by our crews. Um, and very often we're seeing redundant, like not redundant, but overlapping with inlet outlet plus a uh, active mixer. That seems to be uh, very common. Um, especially we've done a few new construction where that was the plan from day one okay. and, and not even, you know, on those, uh, some of them weren't even very large tanks. It was just, uh, let's deal with this. Like, you know, probably at one expense, not decide, you know, two years in that a mixer is needed. It's just putting it in right away. Yeah, that's tied in with what Joe had said about get get all your funding up front for everything you could possibly need. That's a really good idea. Okay, um, more questions from our audience. There's a few in regards to cell antennas. We hate cell antennas, right, everybody? Right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I, um, I can't say yes to that. I can't say yes. Somebody's <laughs> <laughs> making money. <laughs> exactly. So, question: What hardware is recommended for a tank? to facilitate cell carrier cables antennas without damaging the new coating. So um, I guess, uh, Jamie, when you go out there and you're rehabbing a tank, do you ever put in something with the intention that maybe later the owner would be putting cell antennas up on it? Or is it typically the owner knows they are going to put cell antenna antennas and they, they do it then? Uh, we've, we've done both. Um... Sometimes we'll do, you know, modifications to a current system, whether it be, um, you know, new cable attachments that are able to be maintained behind, like a, we call it a Z bracket. Basically, it's a bracket that stands off the tank and allows you to paint behind it. And then, you know, tank maintenance and the cell phone cables can coexist. Um, and then up, you know, wherever the antennas are, um, often we're either... Um, you know, the antennas will be relocated for our work and then maybe we'll improve the mounts um, to a welded on mount instead of uh, like a stud weld approach. Uh, or even we'll put a corral on the top of the tank and uh, we'll get the antennas mounted to a corral. Uh, and we've even had owners uh, on a couple occasions put a corral on just speculatively uh, where they're, you know, they know it's a, a location that's been inquired. Uh, about and um, we'll put a full, you know, basically ready to bolt on system and then they can pedal that to, uh, you know, various cell companies and, um, you know, I guess it's value added for them. You know, they know, they know one that the tanks won't be damaged when cell phone antennas go on that, you know, the interior coatings are going to be fine. The exterior is going to be fine because it's strictly a bolt on. Uh, system and then they can probably get more a uh, higher rent for it since it's prepped. Yeah. So Ralph, what do you guys do? Oh, it, it varies. So a lot of our uh, leases on our tanks. Um, it's interesting when we go through a rehab because the companies, the cell companies, will have to remove their equipment from our tank in order to have somebody's crew, like Jamie's crew, come in and, and repaint. Um, mainly for safety reasons. I, I don't like to have our crews working around live uh, cell equipment for, for multiple reasons. So when they remove it, we try to ask them ahead of time, what do they want back on the tank? And if they are either upgrading equipment or they're putting the same equipment back on, I like to uh, basically have them work with our current contractor to install whatever brackets that they need so it can all be painted the same color. Because what we found is that uh, in our existing tanks now, when new equipment is put on and we give them the paint color to match, it never matches. It's just like in your house. When you do touch-ups on your wall, it's never the same shade. It, it, it could be a, a day old and I swear it's never the same shade. Um, plus, I know uh, our rehab crews are going to do the job correctly in our specifications. When the cell company crews come and put on equipment on our assets, they're not necessarily held to the same standard that I hold my crews to. Not that their work isn't done correctly or done uh, the right way, but it's not necessarily to the standards that we're used to seeing on our tanks. And because we want to have these assets for hundreds of years to provide better service to our customers, we want to make sure we're doing the right thing ahead of time. Yeah, excellent. Uh, so Joe, when it comes to concrete tanks, can an owner just go and you know drill holes and bolt, bolt uh, uh, cell antennas on? No, no. So like on a pre-stress tank, absolutely not. Um, so we. We do get involved occasionally. Um, you know, an owner is, is, is approached by a cell company. We typically get involved very early on and basically act as kind of, you know, like the intermediary a little bit about looking at, at um, a design, confirming that the tank can support it, 
and then providing information and you know, pricing on what it will take to modify the tank to allow for the um, antennas and the cables to be attached. It's, you know, and um, on a cast in place tank, you know, maybe not so much. I mean, the, the, you know, the, those walls are a little more, are, are thicker. There's, you don't have that like pre-stressing wire um, right under the surface. So there are some, um, it, that, you know, that doesn't apply to every single concrete tank, but when dealing with a pre-stressed concrete tank, you, you definitely want to get an expert involved. <laughs> Anytime I want to hang something on a concrete tank, I'm like, Joe, okay, what do I do? <laughs> I've, I've learned and it's not because the tank's falling down. <laughs> I just, I just know. <laughs> okay. I guess, Rob. You know, another point is, you know, whether it's, whether it's, you know, standoffs for conduit uh, on a, on a standpipe or whether it's just spare conduits in, a, in an elevated tank, um, you know, whether it's for a, whether it's for a cell carrier at some point in the future, or whether it's for you know a mixing system at some point in the future, you know it, it, I I I don't we very rarely see a tank job anymore. We're not doing something to facilitate some sort of future, whatever it is. Again, while you're there, while you're while you're we have the tank taken down, you have the right contractor there, get that welding and coating done at the same time. Yeah, good point. Well, you know what? I see we're up against the 315. If my panel can stick around, we've got more to talk about. There's still a few more questions. Uh, but for our audience, I want to make sure that um, they're aware of a few things. So I'm going to share my screen right now. So if you enjoyed yourself this afternoon, we've got more roundtables coming up. Uh, right now we've got two more scheduled and I've got four more on the way. So a wastewater one, pump station design, what operators should know. And that's in March. And then I cannot wait for this one in April. Wonder Women, surviving and thriving in the water and wastewater industries. We may or may not be wearing our Wonder Woman outfits that day. So we're hoping to, it, it's for men and women, uh, but just discussing how we all communicate and how we can do it a little bit better. So uh, I'm very excited. Carol Paul is coming back from Greenville and I've got uh, Liesl Gross from Lehigh County Authority and um, another coworker of mine, plus Tori Morgan's gonna be the moderator. So that'll be a lot of fun. And then coming soon, uh, we've got stuff on environmental regulatory audits. Um, last fall, we had done the water regulatory update. we that again this spring. That'll be a lot of fun. Have a beer with an engineer. Thing on probably doing how to deal with difficult people. So that's always fun. Um, note to self, don't drink beer when you're a moderator. That doesn't work out well. So if you want more information, go to our website, ntechenge.com, and the menu along the top, if you're looking for resources, you can go to roundtables, and you can get more information and sign up. So to wrap things up, I want to provide uh, contact information for everyone on our panel. As I mentioned, we'll still continue our discussion, but if you want to get in touch with anyone, a big thank you to Rob, and here's email for him. Ralph, love you, love your tank uh, expertise. Amy, I was dying to have you on one of my panels, so this is great as well. Joe, so happy to have you back. And Nick, blast getting to hear from you and your experience. Uh, and if you're interested in getting PDH certificates or operator certificates, please send me an email uh, after the round table. So um, let's continue our conversation. Um, so I'll, I'll leave this information up for a moment or two. Um, but panel, um, any more comments about the antennas? Rob, were you going to say something? No, I, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> okay. There was another question from our audience saying, if you're considering putting cell carrier antennas on your tank, what's, what's, the, what's an important thing to do? Uh, so Ralph, uh, when you guys are considering doing that, like what's the most important thing as a tank owner that you guys do? Yeah, it's interesting. I think this COVID pandemic has taught us uh, about the importance of technology and about the importance of feeling connected. So more than ever, uh, we're getting approached by cell companies about water storage tanks, and I'm sure most uh, companies are. And it's not only the big names, it's also some offshoots that want to start up their own cell business kind of thing. And some of the assets and the tanks that we have are either getting prepped for rehab or are at the end of their life and we're looking to replace the asset. So when the company approaches us, it's not always us giving them, yes, sure, go ahead, throw equipment on that tank. We like to make sure that they provide um, verification that the equipment will not impact the load on our tank. As, as Joe mentioned, we wanna make sure our asset can hold the equipment and, 
uh, any sort of wind, any sort of rain, any sort of crazy snowstorms and ice that we're seeing. We want to make sure it can hold that. But we also want to do the right thing for them. So if I'm painting the tank in two years, it doesn't make sense for them to come and, and put equipment on the tank or even within five years because uh, it's a lot of permitting for them and it's a lot of permitting uh, to get the equipment off the tank. So those are some things that I would I would caution ahead of time. And then um, going back to the previous question about cell, cell carriers, I forgot to mention, we have found some success with uh, some high-powered magnets that hold equipment on the side of a tank. Because I think the question was, if we already have a repainted tank, how can we not damage our coating? Right. So I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, you know, there are some magnets, but they're oftentimes so expensive that your cell carrier will basically just want to come weld on your tank instead of buy the magnets. <laughs> so uh, those are a couple options. And what we've seen is, is good practice for new cell carriers as well. Okay. Uh, Nick, or uh, go ahead, Jamie. Oh, the, the one comment I had is uh, when, yeah, when companies are, are putting together a plan to go on a tank, um, I think, especially with smaller uh, water companies, um, you know, they don't necessarily have the resources or know how to take a look at that plan and kind of vet the plan in their interest, for their interests. Um, I've gotten involved with a, with a small local municipality just looking over what is being submitted to them. And often it's garbage. <laughs> There'd be a you know, plans with multiple um, uh, discrepancies. You know, once one page says there's three three new antennas going on, and then next page says there's six new antennas going on, that sort of thing. And, you know, then going out to a tank and realizing that the cell phone cables have been run over top of the roof manhole, and now you can no longer open the tank and look in. You know, so those kind of things, um, you know, just... Uh, I feel like water companies that are not in the know or just don't have the resources to be checking that out often get run over. Um, and yeah, I just like if 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 a company is in that situation, like get someone, either an inspection firm or a contractor, get someone to review the plans and then actually look at what's being put on and does it agree with the plans? Cause that that's often uh, what's actually done versus the plans does not always line up as well. No, I, I, like a part of me is like, call us, email us, any of us on this panel, we can help you. Because there's been so many times where an owner's like, yeah, well, they see dollar signs. And that's exciting. I mean, imagine getting an extra 20000 a year, 30000 a year, multiple carriers. Oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> and, but having no idea the damage it can do uh, to your tank long term. <laughs> so yeah, um, have, so have someone look at the contract and look at it from long term, like, you don't want the equipment shed right next to the tank where it could be in the way of containment the next time you paint it. It's all these little things that when you've done it a bunch of times, like any of us here, we know. Uh, uh, Rob? I mean, not to mention at some point you're going to have to paint that tank again. And that's something, you know, Nick and I are working on a project together now that it, we have two cell carriers on a tank now that we have to have, they have to remove themselves from the tank before we can tank paint. And then, you know, one of them did something that caused some damage to the tank. So we have to do that repairs at the same time. So, you know, it, at some point you have to work around it to do an actual job and, and they're going to have to come off the tank. So, you know, again, th this is th that particular effort. Um, you know, we're, we're probably a year into it, that coordination effort with those two cell carriers trying to, okay, this is where we are. And, you know, we're meeting every, at least every quarter and it'll probably ramp up here as we get closer to the actual project, but just making sure we're all on the same page and, 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 you know, who's going to do what and where are we going to put temporaries? And I mean, these guys do this stuff, they know how to do it, but it takes a lot of coordination, a lot of effort and a lot of expense um, to pull a cell carrier off of a tank to do a full rehab on it. So. And you've been through dozens of these. So, you know, the step-by-step -step process, I can't imagine for an owner who's never done it. And they're like, uh, like, I'll never forget. I was in Jersey 10 years ago at the pre-construction meeting, painters ready to go, engineers there. And I'm like, so uh, cell antennas, they off the tank, painters starting on Monday. And they're like, well, we tried calling them. They haven't gotten back to us yet. <laughs> cell carriers were still on the tank. No, they don't even have a contact name. And the painter wants to start next week. Uh, I think I laughed. A couple, couple points. Um, 
it's really important to know the contract. You know, have someone legally look it over and help have the third party have some contribution to these maintenance type in the future. Uh, we also recommend on the pre-existing for upgrade to do a pre and post installation because you'll find that on a brand new tank come out perfect and then you get a call from the, the owner that our, we got measles and bleed pinpoint rusting on a roof only to find out that they left all the metal shavings up there so we always ask them to vacuum or bring a magnet to clean up their installations so i mean i we this is a 70 this is a whole program all itself on, on i know on but I do know historically that in the 90s, they had no respect for tanks at all. Well, how about 2020? No, they don't, they, they don't give a shit. They want to get in and get out as fast as they can and get away with whatever they can. So that pre and post installation inspection, oh, it's bold for the owner to have photos. Uh, Ralph? Yeah, a couple things. Uh, there was a comment to ask to put the, uh, our contact information yeah. back up yeah. if you, you could. Text, text, I'll email it to you. Okay? All right. <laughs> And then the other thing is we actually just we just went through that where we had a tank uh, brand new repainted and we had two cell carriers put their equipment back on the tank and then there was some damage afterwards and uh, our contractor came back to do some touch ups and some CIM coating and things like that and saw the damage. And so uh, it, it was a little bit of a finger pointing, you know, it wasn't this contractor, it was that contractor and it wasn't this company, it was that one. So I agree um, if you can write it into your contract to have a pre and post inspection at the cost of the cell carrier and not your, your firm or your entity, uh, that's a big recommendation for sure. Yeah, yeah. And like if no one has a copy of the contract, just pretend that that's required. <laughs> had that work very, shh, don't tell the cell carriers works very effectively <laughs> Say it with conviction they'll believe you <laughs> uh did you have a comment rob no okay a uh, couple more questions we got two more questions from our audience and these are on topics we haven't even covered yet so let's just touch on these quickly um how many times have you seen the concrete foundation on a ground level st uh, steel tank fail so anyone ever see a foundation fail? Nick, what have you seen? Well, we have one now for a private uh, industry that's up in the hills and it appears the slope is slipping and the tank is moving. Mm -hmm. So um, they're, we're recommending a, com a comprehensive geotechnical study be done and determine whether it's just better just to build a new one because okay. we, you know our preliminary cost, uh, the engineering estimate right now is putting them close to a million dollars and you know for for what they're getting for a million isn't a really best, you know, it should be more like a 1.5. It mm -hmm. needs everything from lead, the tank sloping, you know, on and on, the geotech study, bringing rigs up there. So at the end of the day, we're recommending they just build a new tank down at the bottom of the hill by the plant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else ever, like, I've never seen it. I mean, there's some spalling here and there, but a failure, nope. In fact, um, I built a new like 2 million gallon reservoir on an old foundation. <laughs> Typically a tank contractor doesn't want to do it because there's liability there. But, um, things built in the fifties, they were built to last. <laughs> so the fact that we could reuse it, I loved it. Oh, well, we have a good one. We, we, uh, one of our clients built three, one, 1. 1.5 million gallon, uh, single pedals, single, you know, spheroids. Uh -huh. One of them settled and they simply, and I think it was CB&I, because uh, this is why I didn't get to see this. I wish I did. They came in and they literally emptied the tank, disconnected the anchor bolts, pounded shims in it, and leveled up the, the tank. And I guess it worked. That's cool. It worked. Yeah, it worked. So <laughs> far, it's me. only been 10 years, but it worked. <laughs> hey, and one more question from our audience. Um, uh, what is used to de determine when a cathodic protection system is needed in a tank? Uh, he says he's only ever worked in one system that actually had cathodic protection uh, in their tanks. None of the other systems have had them. So I'm curious, Ralph, do you guys have cathodic protection in any of your tanks? We do. Um, a lot of the glass lined tanks that we have have cathodic protection systems. Um, um, the majority of the steel tanks we have, we use a zinc primer that acts very similarly to the cathodic protection system. So I don't want to say it's an either or, uh, but a lot of your old style uh, tanks that I may get inspected, one of the recommendations from, you know, Nick's inspection report might say, hey, we recommend putting a 
cathodic protection system in here and would detail the reasons why. Um, and a new tank, you're either going to specify a zinc primer or you're going to put one in if you're not going to utilize something like that. And again, the, the mid-Atlantic tanks, uh, the reason they specify it is because they don't have that sort of primer in there. So to make sure that if their sealant comes off of the bolts, you're not eating away at the bolts, you have that that sacrificial anode in there that is giving itself up as opposed to giving your tank up. So it's, um, in those tank, it's sacrificial. There's like ribbons or there's bars on the bottom, right? So Correct. that gets eaten away and not the, the structure itself. How often do you have to replace those bars? Any sense of that? If their sealant's good, uh, we, we don't have to replace it too often. No, we, and the thing about those tanks that, you know, concrete tanks have their benefits, uh, steel tanks have their benefits, those tanks have their benefits, and it's, it's all a trade-off, right? Um, concrete, there's very little maintenance unless you see the things that Joe mentioned earlier. Those tanks, there may be more maintenance, uh, you know, small things, but it's, it's all a trade-off, right? I would say we replace those maybe every 10 to 15 years. It's not very okay. often. Okay, no, I just and wanted one, to get a sense of that. Nick. One last factor on cathodic protection. It obviously works. It needs to be maintained unless it's sacrificial. Somebody does need to monitor it and check the rectifier. So typically you, you'll need a contract with a CP firm. The only problem we see with CP is that it works great from the water level down, not from the water level up where vapor is vapor zones and chlorine gases do the most damage. Amen. Yeah, and uh, um, we have a client where they had it in a bunch of tanks and the main problems in all of them was a roof framing and roof rafters and I'm like, it doesn't help it. <laughs> so uh, every tank's gonna be a little different. Every situation's a little different. So to pull someone in like you, Nick, who, who's seen them all and sort of knows long-term, okay, what's gonna work, what's not, or where, where your struggles are uh, so valuable. Okay, uh, so do you want to wrap things up? I want to go back to my panel. Any final comments for our audience? Anything we didn't address that, any final words of wisdom you can give to the people out there? So Rob, anything you want to share? Uh, no, nothing really, just that, that, that point about the cathodic protection. I've heard, you know, now Christine and, and Nick both both make that exact point. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that is, you know, when it comes to certain applications, it's something that's really necessary. Um, other times they're just almost outlived its usefulness to, to some extent when in certain circumstances, again, with today's coding. So, um, but no, it's been a good time. Okay. Uh, Jamie, any comments? Um, yeah. I mean, I would echo what was just said about the cathodic, um, you know, the difficult areas to paint on a tank are typically your roof structures and it doesn't help you there. Um, so from our perspective, we take out more systems than put in systems. Um, and that I'm talking about the active ones, not the passive ones like the glass lined uh, tanks would get. Um, but, you know, we still do see specifications that uh, request they be part of the project or at least options. Often you see it as an option in a bit. Yeah, interesting. Okay, uh, final words of wisdom. Anything from you, Joe? Yeah, I just, I guess I would just say that, you know, with, with um, you know, with like rehab projects like this, I mean, there is no magic bullet, no magic product that's going to be that simple fix. So you know, I would say if you are in a situation where you have an older tank, system, and think that it's in need of some type of rehab, take a very calculated approach. Here. It might be a slow approach, but it's the best approach. Get your good inspection, get a, uh, a consulting engineer, reach out, you know, um, you know, like uh, for expert help and plan this whole process because the little things like getting the cell antennas off or do you need storage on site while you have the pre out of service, all well, things you'd much rather know beforehand than right as you're, as, you're, as you're doing. And then it's also gonna help you get a much better accurate cost for this project. Mm -hmm. Everyone's I know afraid of costs and wants to try to do it as, as low cost as possible, but you're better off knowing what the actual cost is before you start than knowing what it is after and have that cost be much more than what you budgeted for or, or like what you planned on. So, you know, kind of take that, take that. Good point. Thank you. Yeah. Nick, any final words? Well, uh, I like to briefly uh, with a broad, broad brush mention to all the clients, those that have a budget and those who don't. Um, the best approach to this is, is get a good inspection and a good firm on board and take the three approaches, a good, better, best. Get the options for all three of those. You'll find that nowadays with the new coatings, a good approach will probably do very well. If you can't afford the best, 
You don't need a jacuzzi on the top of your tank, for example. But if you can't afford the best, you'll be surprised what a good system you can you can find out there. Hey, Ralph, you have any jacuzzis on the roofs of your tanks? Oh my gosh, We're not, I, not, I, you're not telling us. I wish. I wish. Just like everybody else, uh, you know, budget struggles are a real thing. And uh, something that was mentioned that I don't think we touched on is the planning before you remove a tank from service. So from an owner's point of view, uh, sometimes there's tanks that I can't remove from service. And I call Jamie up and I say, Jamie, what kind of solutions do you have? And there are solutions out there for temporary storage that uh, Rob can help you permit with, uh, you know, and it's, it gives you different solutions. So I think um, anybody that's a novice out there can feel free to reach out to any of us via email and we'll try to help you as best as we can. Um, and I swear I won't charge you too much for it. <laughs> oh, God. Well, uh, huge, huge thank you to my panel. Uh, I love you guys. <laughs> You're amazing. Uh, and I always say magical things happen when you bring together passionate people. And you guys are all very clearly passionate about tanks and rehab. So thank you. So everyone, have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thanks. Take care.